In this episode of Shaping the Future, I'm speaking with Alice Hill, who was Special Assistant to President Obama at the White House and Senior Director for Resilience Policy at the National Security Council, working on climate change and pandemic preparedness. In her new book to be published on the 5th of September, Alice makes the case for why it is imperative that we begin the necessary planning for adaptation for concurrent and consecutive climate extremes that threaten society the world over. With COP26 on the horizon, we are seeing decades of climate policy or mitigation come to virtually nothing as emissions still rise. The case being made here is that it is essential we make adaptation and building resilience a central feature of our approach to this decade and beyond. Please do subscribe to Shaping the Future as we explore many of the critical issues we face right now. In the next episode, I speak to Jason Hickel, author of Less is More, How Degrowth Will Save the World. Please also visit gen.cc for more information and also please consider supporting my work via Patreon. If COP26 goes ahead, I will also be reporting daily from Glasgow. Thanks for listening. Okay, Alice, it's fantastic to speak to you. Most of the narrative around our climate change response at the moment is very focused on mitigation and debate rages on regarding whether we're doing enough and it's fast enough, etc. Your book is a very pragmatic and in many ways reassuring breakdown of what we need to do to adapt to climate impacts. Can you start by giving us some background on what led you to write a book that is essentially a global climate preparedness strategy? Well, let me just say, I love your description. Uh, I had never heard the book called that, but when you said it, it it's accurate. Uh, that is what I was attempting to do. And of course, mitigation, that is the cutting of emissions is critical. We just had a very important report from the IPCC underlying how crucial it is that we cut our emissions. So my book is not in any way designed to have a theme that we shouldn't be doing that. But what's clear now is that we need to adapt. So what drove me to write the book is my prior experience. I worked in the Obama administration and I had responsibility for both climate adaptation as well as preparedness for biological threats, be it a pandemic or some kind of aerosolized anthrax attack. And as I began to experience the pandemic with the rest of the world, it reminded me of the parallels between these two catastrophic risks. And I wanted to draw from our collective experience with one catastrophic risk, the pandemic, to inform another catastrophic risk in, in terms of preparedness for that, which is climate change, the climate change impacts that are a result of the accumulation of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Okay, and one thing about this is, is that it's all new territory and it comes down to how humans respond to things that we, we haven't seen before, or we can't anticipate very well. And you refer to these as failures of imagination and this kind of not being able to prepare effectively. Can you elaborate on what that really means and the tools we will need to develop and deploy in order to try and fill that imagination gap? We well, are absolutely right. Failures of imagination, I, I'm sure they have plagued humanity uh, since time immemorial, simply because the human brain doesn't assess risk based on what may actually occur. We assess risk based on what we've experienced in the past. And that default of assessing risk based on what experience we experienced in the past has held us in extremely good stead. But with climate change, we are experiencing unfamiliar events and will continue to experience unfamiliar extremes going forward. And to be prepared for those, we need to imagine them. But if you look at almost any major catastrophe, be it 9-11, uh, I'll speak from my own experience in the United States, the terrorism tax, there's always an after action or some kind of investigation of these big events. And there's usually a conclusion there was a failure of imagination. So the 9-11 Commission, that's, they said that was one of the biggest flaws in the United States preparedness was we simply couldn't imagine terrorists driving two planes into a building before it actually occurred. 
we uh, had when Japanese bond us uh, in before World War II. Uh, again, a commission determined it was failure of imagination. And then the, in Australia with the wildfires, uh, their, their commission uh, also said it was failure of imagination. So we're gonna have massive failures of imagination going forward as we experience unfamiliar events. Your question goes to how do we correct that? And there are a number of tools around. One uh, was developed interestingly out of Hollywood. There was a researcher at the Rand Corporation, which sits right on the Pacific Ocean in Santa Monica, California, very near the, the Hollywood studios. And that researcher determined, you know, we could take what Hollywood does in terms of formulating scenarios of what things could happen and use that to help prime people's imagination to understand the very worst. And the other thing that we can do is to capture the momentum that occurs immediately after an event to try to, to use our immediate past experience to expand us to imagine even worse events in the future. So take that recency, and it's called recency bias, uh, and use it to our advantage in going forward. So it takes intentional work, it takes planning, it takes focus, but it the payoff is enormous. And we saw that as uh, the pandemic spread across the globe. Some nations did better because they had worked on imagining something worse. Okay, so yeah, filling the imagination gap. And, and we're getting really strong signals, especially this year, on what extreme climate-driven impacts look like. And I mean, that's quite a lot for a lot of people to, to really see and even via media, let alone firsthand, you're discussing preparedness for concurrent and consecutive disasters, which is really another layer. And we are, in, and we talk about this a lot on the podcast, is that we are entering this phase of acceleration. Can you give an example of this kind of scenario and the resilience that we are going to have to develop to exist amongst it? Yes, I mean, we've had graphic examples uh, this year during the pandemic. First of all, having the pandemic unfold is a catastrophic risk that's everywhere, a uh, threat. But then we've had the hottest July, we've had wildfires, we've had uh, typhoons, we've had hurricanes, we've had extreme heat waves that is just a killer. And all of those are occurring at once along with the pandemic. So we had never, I don't think anyone had ever imagined all of this occurring at once. The demands on our emergency managers, on our hospitals, on response have been just astounding, uh, too much. But let's just narrow it down to climate impacts. And this was an important piece that was brought out by the recent IPCC report, which came out in August of this year. And it talked about uh, how climate impacts compound. So very severe drought, which we're experiencing in the West of America. And then that compounds because it's so dry, it makes uh, the landscape prone for wildfire which we are now having. And then you get other results from that. You get poor air quality, but all of these things work together and make it just worse. Yeah. And we need to step back and not just say, oh, we're gonna prepare for one hurricane. We need to prepare for a hurricane during a pandemic, which means you might wanna put your emergency supplies in different areas. And it might be that we're gonna have a heat wave plus wildfires plus a drought occurring at once. So it seems like building resilience on this kind of level is something we're not prepared at the moment. If you take the US or Europe, for example, we don't seem to hear much talk about preparation for adaptation, or especially compared to places like Bangladesh, who do have these sort of typhoon warning systems, and the impacts are becoming more severe and widespread. Why is it so hard for us developed nations to get our head around it and to get ahead on it? I think it's because we have really had the luxury of not needing to be prepared. In developing nations, they're living much closer to their climate. Their buildings aren't as secure as ours are, aren't as sturdy. Uh, and uh, they're much more dependent on, you have smallhold farmers, you have uh, nomads uh, who are uh, relying on cattle grazing. Uh, so they're living much closer to the land and are much more sensitive to it. And so they've experienced these uh, impacts 
more deeply than we have. In the developed world, we have suffered from a collective failure of imagination simply because we haven't felt the urgency and haven't built back from particular events. And this is a real challenge in the United States because the types of impacts we experience very widely across our geography. We uh, have a very diverse geography, and so that's made it more difficult on the national level for us to focus on an overall scheme. And it's also our political setup, which we are states. So developing early warning systems that really work across municipal lines and those things, we haven't made as much progress. But a country like Bangladesh or India that's been hit by terrible cyclones repeatedly has taken that to heart. They have shelters, they have warning systems, they've thought about schools that can float as flooding occurs. So they've gotten down to the ground level. Now there is, are a couple of exceptions. Netherlands has done a, a remarkable job. I think that's recognized uh, worldwide. Always more to do, but uh, the United States has a steep hill to climb at the moment. And one thing you mentioned in the book, well, throughout the book, really, is, is this idea of no moreism, And it's when something happens that's so dramatic and the population and everybody is kind of in harmony and they say, right, no more of this, we can't handle it. And that's another device in a way that we almost have to put into our thinking. Um, I think that's one of the messages you're, you're pushing in the book is that we need to understand what that really means and use it as part of our strategy. Absolutely. President Obama's first chief of staff said something that I've always remembered, never let a good crisis go to waste. And by that meant learn from what's unfolding to do better in the future. And so I'm confident after this terrible flooding in Europe this summer, Europe's going to have better early warning systems. They're going to have better flood protection. They're going to have much better understanding of how rivers flood in uh, under conditions of climate change. We saw that here in the United States after we had Superstorm Sandy hit Manhattan and plunged the city that never sleeps into darkness. Um, after that, a lot of work on uh, building better going forward, taking advantage of that collective experience to, for example, strengthen our electric grid in that area. Now, one of the challenges with relying on the no more moment is it fades over time uh, as memories fade. And so we see some countries like Japan actively setting aside days and museums and programs to memorialize the moment of crisis so that newer people who didn't actually experience the crisis learn about the crisis and feel that motivation to continue to prepare so it's not lost or dissipated simply because different people are now occupying uh, those spaces. Okay, and something we do especially in Britain with the First and Second World Wars, you kind of use them as these totems to, as they, to remind us of how many people were lost and hopefully that we don't want to do it again. Um, yes, but what we're seeing is they're uh, for natural disasters. To yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And Japan has done this particularly well with earthquakes um, as well as tsunamis because Japan is so prone to disasters just naturally. Uh, so taking that that commemorative approach uh, for wars and applying it to um, naturally occurring phenomena to make sure that people understand that just because you haven't experienced it in your lifetime does not mean this is not a continuing risk. And of course, with climate change, much more likely you'll experience uh, many worse natural disasters than we would have without climate change. And one of the, the things that you particularly focus on, which certainly resonated with me, is the you outlined some of the excellent examples of leadership success and leadership failures, making the real point, I think it's one of your titles, is leadership matters. You know, looking at how countries have responded to the pandemic, there are obvious winners and losers. But generally, are you seeing the leadership qualities we need to steer us through the critical resilience building years that we've got ahead of us? Well, we see pockets of it. We definitely see that uh, some places there is a focus on resilience. We've mentioned to uh, the Netherlands and Bangladesh. And we see also pockets of focusing on a particular threat, whether it's a big storm or a heat wave. 
France was hit terribly in 2003 by a heat wave, uh, excess deaths, meaning that more people died as a result of the heat wave, about 15,000, and that gave France a no more moment. So now France is one of the world leaders in preparing for extreme heat events. So we see that, that there is progress, but of course with climate change, as you said, it's happening very quickly now. Uh, these events will get bigger and bigger. And even if we cut our emissions to zero tomorrow, just because of the delayed heating caused by the accumulation of greenhouse gas emissions, we will continue to heat for at least several more decades. Yeah, absolutely. Another major theme that you highlight, this one is really interesting, is the borderless nature of climate change and how our response should be equally borderless. In the US and UK, we seem to have been a little bit over-obsessed with our borders recently, and it ties into this whole subject. How does greater resilience relate to that cross-border cooperation? Well, the pandemic made clear that a catastrophic risk of that type, and similarly, the catastrophic risks from climate change, sea level rise, heat, wildfires, more extreme storms, deeper droughts, those risks don't honor in any way these borders and boundaries that humans have been so carefully crafting over the millennia to decide and organize themselves uh, going forward. But as it turns out, when it, we are combating or preparing for these types of events, those borders hinder our ability to be prepared because you know, on one side you have one government, on the other side you have another government or another community and they're following different rules, different practices, and the choice of one community can definitely hurt another community. Just imagine a seawall, one, one community that says, it's great, we're going to build a huge seawall right around us. Well, where's all that water going to go? It's going to go to the adjoining communities. So with these types of risks, if we don't figure out how to get over our uh, organization of ourselves around borders and plan and prepare across borders, we make ourselves highly vulnerable going forward. Yeah, and the couple of areas that you do highlight is the water sharing, which is a huge one in some regions, which, which I think from a previous interview, it was pretty much laid out to me that it makes conflict inevitable if it is not handled correctly. Climate change is a story of too much water or too little water, but too little water is going to be um, very serious in terms of how people manage that and manage sharing going forward. You know, historically, water has not been typically a source of conflict. It's been rare for it to be a source of conflict, but I think we can anticipate they'll certainly, whether it's armed conflict, there'll certainly be a lot more conflict over it. We're having a very dramatic example here in the United States. Our Colorado Rivershed is very important for providing water to the Western United States, but for the first time, we, we put some major dams on the Colorado River uh, for hydropower, but the water levels are so low that they are having to tell states, you're not going to get the water you expect. And the nation and all those affected com communities and states will need to reconsider the agreements that have bound them in the past. And the, all of those agreements, virtually all of our agreements for water sharing that we have reached, and we've reached many around the globe, have assumed that water levels are stable, that like they're, they are what they were in the past. Well, that's not true anymore with climate change. So if you're assuming that you're going to have a steady flow down a particular river, you probably won't. Uh, and that will upend all of these agreements. So it's a lot of work ahead to negotiate how we're going to share diminishing amounts of water going forward. Yeah. And of course, another side effect of something like the drought is, um, is climate refugees and how we how we manage this which is we haven't really got to the crisis yet but it's how do we how do we approach it you use the term survival migrants and i've never really heard this term before can you talk a little bit about that and this sort of landscape that we're entering into yes we are seeing people on the move because of climate change they really have no choice but to be on the move 
because the United States is experiencing this, for example, right along our southern border right now. We have three countries in the Northern Triangle, it's called, and those three countries, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, have been particularly hard hit by climate change already. There's been a coffee fungus, there's been drought, there are also countries that have seen a great deal of violence uh, and a lot of gang warfare, so pretty unstable governments already. And then we saw two back-to-back very large hurricanes last summer. Not surprisingly, and there were, there were reports in the media, people saying, I have nothing left. I have no choice. I have to go. Everything's been demolished here, and that's what's driving is survival is driving these migrants northward. When I was at the Department of Homeland Security, we experienced a big surge of children from those three countries, the Northern Triangle, which I was responsible for managing. Uh, And it made me begin to think, wow, this is just really a glimmer of what's ahead with climate change because these kids were moving north because the agriculture had collapsed in part as a result of climate change impacts. And their families were looking around and saying, I don't want this kid to get in a gang. Uh, They're mostly uh, older male teenagers. I I want them to get to a better life. And so save up their money, uh, get themselves a coyote, uh, somebody to help the kid across the border. And we saw just a huge surge of kids. And now, of course, we're seeing even larger numbers at our southern border because we've just had these two hurricanes. The world does not have a plan for this. You refer to them as climate refugees, uh, but our refugee treaties and understandings don't treat them as refugees. They just say they're migrants. And so what we see is borders closing and trying to keep out those migrants because they're driven by survival, uh, not by some, the refugee law requires some persecution or some other thing, and that's harder to prove. So we need an overhaul of how we think about migration, given the really hard to imagine numbers of people that will be on the move. The way you described it then was was very empathetic in terms of your experience. You went down and you saw it firsthand. And yet a lot of the time in the media, especially, it can be presented, it can be politicized and presented as not so empathetic, as more of a threat, as sort of an invasion almost. And that happens in Europe, as I'm sure as well as the US, how do we, when we're trying to rewrite these plans uh, of these kinds of how we see and view and manage this crisis, which is gonna get much bigger, how do we insert that humanity into it on a much more global level? (laughs) It's quite a big question. Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think that we've seen, where you mentioned World War II, uh, examples, uh, humanity and, and inhumanity in terms of allowing people in uh, during a crisis. Uh, and uh, certainly, and I advocate in my book that we start, uh, we can use some of the models in the past, uh, so called a Nance, in, in, after World War II, there was a Nansen passport named after a gentleman who figured out that Migrants need just an opportunity to go to another country and work and give temporary passports that allow them to do that. And then uh, we need to think through how can we allow uh, and help people at this moment get back on their feet. But most importantly, we need to invest in making these countries stronger so that people aren't on the move in the first place. The best result here is for people to stay at home. And the way to help them is to help them adapt to whatever new extremes they will experience in their communities going forward. So our development work, our diplomacy work should focus on ways to help people thrive at home so they're not becoming survival migrants going forward. Again, it's about going to the crisis where it's the source and trying to build the resilience that will help them with the crisis that's unfolding, which is a, a source of, it's, a, it's actually helping ourselves in the bigger picture. Absolutely. This is in our self-interest. Uh, it's in our national security interest, and it's in our economic interest to help 
these other countries do much better with adaptation. And that's one of the unfortunate developments in our negotiations worldwide through the UN on climate. Adaptation has been treated like a poor cousin. Uh, it has received far fewer dollars, not much attention, and we are way behind. And essentially not much has happened on adaptation. We, we are way behind on cutting our emissions, but we're also way behind on adaptation. And so one of the things in my book is that we need to be able to do both. It's not that we should do adaptation to the exclusion of mitigation, but we can't do just mitigation or we're gonna have all these impacts come in that undermine. Let's say you just put up a beautiful solar farm, but if you have a plan for that solar farm to withstand the new higher winds that are coming, it's all going to be not worth very much. So we need to be able to work together to plan these two efforts to be complementary to each other. Okay. And you mentioned dollars and the UK has just cut uh, its overseas aid budget, but you highlight very specifically and, and on quite a few different examples of how, a, a, you know, one dollar spent tackling the problem in advance vastly saves. It's a very, very good investment, basically. Can you talk yes. a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, well, you know, one of our founding fathers is uh, credited with the expression, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Well, that is definitely true when it, uh, that was Ben Franklin, by the way. That is definitely true when you're talking about preparing for disasters and disasters worsened by climate change. So building codes. We have a recent study in the United States from our National Institute of Building Sciences that found that for every dollar you spend in building buildings to stronger building codes plus enforcement of those building codes, because you can have the building code, but if nobody enforces it, sometimes the building doesn't get built to code. But through the codes and enforcement, for every dollar you spend, you can save $11. Overall, the estimate is for every dollar you save in disaster preparedness, you save $6 in damages. So right now, our paradigm is we pour all the money in after the fact, after the typhoon, after the wildfire. We're going to pour huge amounts of money into those communities. But if we instead started to say, let's take some of that money and apply it to helping those communities prepare, we would have far less damage when the bad thing happened. But right now, our model is, is poor. Uh, because we put in the money after the fact, after the fact, after the community's destroyed, we help them get back on their feet. And then we don't always, probably aren't doing it in a way that will be resilient to future worse impacts of climate change. So this is, this is really gearing back and refocusing on preparedness as the key to buffering really the severity of what climate change brings. And a big part of this whole system, and this is another part you mentioned, is about the insurance industry, because eventually the insurance industry just said, I, we can't do this anymore. So how close are we now to a point where the insurers just say, we can't do this anymore for high risk areas? Or, and can, is it preventable? Can we do more to stop the insurers stopping? We will definitely see insurance companies leave markets. Uh, I predict that in California, this fall, you will see some insurers trying to leave California because of the wildfire challenge. Some don't think that's a sound investment to be insuring for wildfire risk in California anymore. The reason they haven't left already is because the California Department of Insurance has essentially said for the last few years, we will not allow you to not renew policies in areas that are close to fires. So they really required the insurers to stay. But over time, I believe they will leave. If you step back, an even bigger challenge than just an individual insurance company deciding they don't want to offer insurance for a particular peril is that insurance companies just will eventually decide they don't want to be in, in the business of insuring for property. And this was brought home to me. I visited the CEO of a major reinsurer uh, in one of our insurance centers in the United States, Hartford, Connecticut. And we were talking about climate changes a number of years ago. And, and he shared with me that he thought climate change was too big 
even for the reinsurers. The reinsurers, of course, are companies that insure insurance companies because insurance company, if there's a big event, it could go bankrupt because it has so many policies in one area. The reinsurance company comes in and gives the insurance company some a policy to say, look, if that happens, we'll cover you. You can get insurance from us to weather that one really bad event. But for reinsurers, this may be too big. And they may say, we don't want a part of that business. And if they leave, all that leaves is governments. We have already seen insurers in the United States leave for flood. In the 1960s, they essentially, we had a bunch of floods and they said, you know what, private insurers, we don't really want to be in this space anymore. So federal government came in in the United States and said, we're going to create our own national federal flood insurance program that the federal government will offer. Well, that experiment is many years old, decades years old now, and I think it's widely viewed as very troubled because it's basically bankrupt. Uh, and the only way it keeps surviving is because our Congress keeps giving it money. And it's proved to be really, I think, a lesson for many other countries around the world as to the challenges of having your government step into the business of ensuring the politics behind it, the yeah. stakeholders' interests in it, the adjustment of rates when it's the government, all that becomes very complicated. And our goal should be, in my opinion, to help private insurers be able to maintain a thriving market for insurance that allows people people to get affordable insurance for their homes. Sure. This is the last sort of question, really. In a press conference a few days ago with an agriculture producer in the US, I asked how much of their climate strategy was allocated towards adaptation. And I kind of had our conversation in, my, in mind when I did. The answer came back that the focus was purely on mitigation. Can you end by summarizing why adaptation planning and mitigation strategies must be treated with equal seriousness right now? Yes, we know that we are warming very quickly now, and we need to address that by cutting emissions, both carbon emissions, as well as methane, which is a particularly potent form of greenhouse gas, uh, as well as other types of emissions. And that's important to avoid the very worst of heating going forward. But we can't ignore adaptation anymore, because it will upend all our efforts to cut emissions. As you see wildfires, huge amounts of carbon going into the air as a result of wildfires. You see these massive heating events, which can cause really severe uh, deaths and be harmful to the economy. And if we're not prepared for those, it just in the long term lessens the viability and the strength of communities going forward. One of the criticisms of the economists who have studied the costs of climate change is that they simply fail to capture how climate change would affect all of our systems. It undermines all of our built systems. So if we haven't prepared, we have in California, the sixth largest economy in the world, having to cut its power to prevent wildfires. That's not a good at long-term approach. Uh, similarly, Texas, they failed to prepare for freezing weather, cost them billions and billions of dollars lost when a deep freeze came, and it also caused people's lives. So that gets back to these costs are mounting and someone will pay them. If it's not insurance, that means individuals carry that on their own. And over the long haul, that just pulls down the global economy makes us all poor and gives us less to invest in making sure that we have clean energy going forward. So these two efforts need to work together in complementary ways, or we will make choices in one that negatively affects our ability to succeed in the other. It can be called maladaptation or malmitigation, but either way, we need to make sure that whatever choices we make, cut emissions, but also prepare us. Okay. Well, look, thank you very much. It's been great to talk to you. And I urge everybody <laughs> to, to read your book because it really is very, very insightful. So thanks again. Oh, thank you. What a pleasure to join you.
Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics. Thank you.